Hello everyone, Paul Malutnak here with video number 22. Our uh, uncle died just recently and I was asked to do the message at the memorial service and I wanted to share that message with you. The name of the message is Just Believe Me and in three parts I'd like to share it. First of all, I'd like to talk about God's promises to his people. Secondly, God's evidences that those promises will be kept. They're also called first fruits. And third, who are God's people? First of all, on the promises. First of all, Jesus gives us a lot of metaphors that helps us understand spiritual things. Uh, when the disciples together with Jesus, and he was letting them know that uh, he was going to leave them. He said, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God, also believe in me. And then he gives the first promise. He said, in my father's house are many rooms. Some of us have, uh, have translated it uh, mansions or places. <clears throat> the point here is he's saying, I'm making room for you. Uh, this is not the only life. Uh, it's going to continue for those who believe. And then he said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again. And I'll take you to myself. And that's from John 14. So he tells us that he's making room for us. And then Paul tells us, let's just know that he realizes that this body we have, this this body is a tent. It's, it's uh, temporary, just like the tabernacle was temporary in the wilderness. It was replaced by something greater than that, a temple. So uh, he let us know, Paul lets us know in 2 Corinthians, for we know that if the tent uh, that is our earthly home is destroyed, and they all will be, we have a building from God. So <clears throat> he shows the comparison from a tent to a building, and using that analogy to uh, our lives and our body to what God is going to give us is quite a great uh, difference. He said, this will be a house, a building, a house not made with hands. It will be eternal in the heavens, so it won't be temporary. It'll be forever. And then he says, for this tent, we groan. I don't know about you, but I groan uh, when I realize that my body is not doing what I want it to do. As I get older, we long to put on our heavenly dwelling. We may not think about what we're going to look like in heaven, but we know that, uh, that our bodies now don't always function the way we had hoped that they would. So the next promise is the immediacy. Uh, Paul tells us that while well, we know that while we're at home in this body, we are, in a way, away from the Lord. We're not relating to the Lord as we will. First John 3 talks about how one day we'll know him as he is because we'll be like him. That's a great promise. Uh, some people call it the beatific uh, vision. We would rather be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. That suggests an immediate difference. One or the other. When we're out of this body, we're home with the Lord. So we have these promises. He's preparing a home. Uh, it's an eternal home and the immediacy of being in his presence. He's saying, just believe me. So now from the promises, we go on to the, the evidences or the first fruits or the down payments on that promise. Of course, we know that the uh, farmers gave a 10% uh, uh, first fruit payment on their crops. In 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul tells us, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's telling us that the resurrection is the down payment. In other words, we see it is undisputable that the resurrection took place. People saw him afterwards. And of course, many uh, non-believing scholars try to come up with ideas and ways uh, that theories 
about what really happened to him, but there's, there's a Greek technical term for that. It's called hogwash. There's also extra biblical historic information about what happened in Jesus' day. And I'll tell you, the greatest evidence of the resurrection is the explosion of believers. They exploded. And for centuries, it continued to grow. It grows today. In certain countries, uh, great growth. Then I'd like to talk about what uh, Jesus said in John 14. He said, because I live, that means the resurrection, because I live, you also will live. We love this song by the Gaithers, and because he lives, I could face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Now, another evidence that we have beyond the resurrection is the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. He, he also says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It's a reminder of the promises, the Holy Spirit in us. Just believe me, he says. And third, believers and the Word of God is evidence uh, to the world that his promises are true. In James 1, he says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of God that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creations, of his creators, I should say. So our lives as Christians, the fact that we're following Christ, that we, uh, that we uh, walk with him, our lives have been changed, and that is evidence to the rest of the world that, that his promises are true. All the way from a wealthy White House lawyer, Chuck Colson, who was changed, became the founder of the greatest prison ministry in the world. Or a young teen like uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, quadriplegic, she, she dove into a, uh, a water that was not deep enough. She became a quadriplegic, and yet her life changed, her mind, her heart changed. She was a Christian author, radio host, founder of Johnny's and Friends to Assist the Disabled. See, all those are first fruits, are evidences that his promises are true. Just believe me. And third, who are God's people, the beneficiaries of the promises? Well, I'll take you back to a story in Genesis 15, 1. When uh, God took Abraham and he said, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. And of course, Abraham said, I'm childless. That's what I really want now. My, my estate, everything I have in my house is going to a servant, Eliezer. And then God said to him, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And Abraham was at least 75 years old. He would be 100 before he had the son. And then God told him, took him outside, told him to look towards heaven, number the stars, if you are able to number them so shall your offspring be. We just came back from the beach, and I think about the grains of sand. Numbering them. What a promise he gave Abraham. There was nothing in sight to say that was going to be true. But here's the thing. And he believed, Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as righteousness. The fact that he believed God, not just believed in God, he believed God and it was counted to him. It was reckoned. It was in a legal sense given to him righteousness. That doesn't mean that he all of a sudden became a righteous person in his own, but God counted him righteous. Just believe me. And then 
uh, the disciples were together. And God, Jesus said, and you know the way where I'm going. Of course, Thomas said, no, we don't. We don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, they were expecting Jesus to say, well, you go a mile down the road, see that big tree with a broken branch, make a right, go about two miles to the firehouse, make a left, and then down there you'll see a gas station, and right beyond that uh, is salvation. No, he didn't say that, didn't give us those directions. All he said was, follow me. That's it. And then in 2 Corinthians it said, for our sake, he made him, God, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, we're still sinners, but we follow Christ. And, and we, we uh, do the Bible, not only hear the Bible, but we're sinners, but yet we're counted righteous by God. It is not our own righteousness. It's God's righteousness that he imputes to us. You see, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because by nature we are sinners. And others can tell that we belong to Christ because we are changed. Let me just conclude uh, with this. I have this picture of, of Christ. If you just picture it in your mind, it's, it's Christ standing here with his long hair with a, on a robe flowing and his arms out to the sides. And then within that picture of him, if you just take that outline, picture all these tiny faces. Then picture faces outside him. We know that when we die, there's going to be the judgment. God's going to look down and he's going to see all of us. He's going to see the ones that um, all of us are sinful. But then he's not going to look at us individually. He's going to see Christ, the son whom he loves, who paid the price. And he's going to tell the son, come and bring all of those with you, all of those that are cloaked in Christ. You see, so uh, we have that promise that when we're in Christ, that the judgment is only going to be for the things we've done as Christians and not for between heaven and hell. That's a wonderful promise. Thank you. And please subscribe or share with others. Thank you very much.